118 miles northwest of Las Vegas, Nevada, in a forbidding stretch of desert, lies a mysterious place that is known by many names. Dreamland. Paradise Ranch. Groom Lake. And most notably, Area 51. government does not want to acknowledge that the base exists there. But the fact is, I've been there. There's a runway, there's buildings. It is a extremely secret, secret base. America knows about Area 51. It's now a household term. This is where a lot of our nation's most secret and most important work has been done. Area 51 is a breeding ground for conspiracy. People are willing to believe the most preposterous things about what could actually be going on there. I really don't think the government could conceal a flying saucer that we've had since the year after I was born. I really don't think so. There are a lot of secrets at Area 51. But the ones that they guard the most closely are the ones that could lead some of these officials to federal prison. The whole area is sewn with magnetic sensors and electro-optical trip sensors. Step over the line without a top secret clearance, and they can shoot. Next stop, Area 51. Although officially our government denies its very existence, Area 51 has become part of our popular culture, inspiring films, books, and TV shows. But to truly understand the Area 51 mystique, we must look beyond the extraordinary claims and conspiracy theories. This is Survival City on the atomic testing grounds at Yucca Flat, Nevada. To a time when our nation was gripped by the paranoia of the Cold War. Three, two... One, T-Zero. A time when Area 51 was literally carved out of the Nevada desert. One of the several areas set aside for atomic testing. The area where the, where the Groom Lake Area 51 Air Base exists, uh, that land back in the early 50s was uh, grabbed by the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, which is now called the DOE, the Department of Energy, and these are the people who've been responsible for the nation's nuclear weapons. And they needed somewhere to test them. And uh, South Central Nevada there is uh, a place that no one cared about very much at all. This is not contested ground. And on old maps, if you look at old maps of this area, Atomic Energy Commission maps, you will see it divided up into areas. These are big boxes. And at a certain time, the chunk of land that where Groom Dry Lake is, which is one of the many dry alkaline lake beds that are out in that area, uh, was called Area 51. Those are old maps, and that system is not used anymore. But the name Area 51 is sort of stuck to the place. In the spring of 1955, the area in grid number 51 took on a much larger role in our government's dealings with the Soviet Empire. That year, Lockheed aeronautics engineering genius Kelly Johnson designed America's first super-secret spy plane, the U-2. But Johnson had one problem. He needed a place to test his covert creation. He turned to his trusted friend, civilian test pilot Tony LeVere the man who some say is the true father of Area 51. I told Kelly in simple words, I know exactly what you want, and I'll get right with it, which I did. I'm searching for the perfect dry lake, because I knew 
that a dry lake is the best natural landing field for experimental flying that ever was devised. For nearly a week, Tony LeVere and his team scoured the Nevada desert, checking out dozens of remote sites. But when they crossed the Nellis mountain range and came upon Groom Lake, LeVere immediately knew that their search was over. This thing is a, on a scale of one to ten. It's a ten plus. Well, the rest of them don't even stand a chance. Its location was really out in a godforsaken country. And uh, not very many people roam around those parts. And it turned out that the CIA over across the hill, some 30, 40 miles from us, had all the facilities and equipment to do this sort of stuff. And they said, we'll build the base for you. And with that, Area 51 became our government's most top secret military facility. Within a few short weeks, Tony LeVere found himself behind the controls of Kelly Johnson's Cold War brainchild, the U-2 spy plane. In any war, the most powerful weapon is information about the enemy. In the late 1950s, the U-2 spy plane, developed and test flown at Area 51, became our government's secret weapon in the Cold War against the Soviet Union. We knew the Russians were working as fast and cleverly as they could to make nuclear bombs, but we had no way to look into their vast terrain. So the CIA, went to the Lockheed Skunk Works, which is a very brilliant little engineering group at the time, and said, can you make us something that flies high? And with a bunch of fast work, made one of the first really invincible spy planes, the U-2. Equipped with sensitive infrared cameras, the U-2 was capable of producing detailed aerial images of enemy installations from as high up as 80,000 feet beyond the range of enemy radar. Although the U-2 was actually a spy plane, a cover story was put out that it was being tested at Groom Lake for high-altitude weather research for the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, a predecessor to NASA. And the aircraft were actually painted in false NACA markings in case one crashed off-site. For years, the U-2 flew dozens of clandestine missions with total anonymity bringing back vital photographic proof of Russia's military and nuclear weapons buildup. But in May of 1960, all the secrets surrounding the U-2 spy plane came crashing down. Secret reconnaissance of Russia by high-flying American U-2 jets ended when one was downed deep in Soviet territory. Its pilot, Francis Powers, was made the subject of a showcase trial. So you had this famous shoot-down of Francis Gary Powers and uh, he was captured, and this was at a very sensitive moment in time when there was uh, a summit meeting coming between Eisenhower and Khrushchev, and about five days before this, our guy falls out of the sky in an unacknowledged airplane, and this, of course, created a huge flap. Gary Powers was convicted of spying by a Soviet court and sentenced to 10 years in prison. However, he was later released and exchanged for a Soviet agent in U.S. custody. There's no question in my mind that the intelligence that they got on Russia probably kept us out of World War III. But the U-2 was just the first of many top secret aircraft to be developed and tested in the desert skies over Area 51. After the U-2 program was completed, they used the Groom Lake facility to test the A-12 spy plane, which is capable of flying in excess of Mach 3 at altitudes above 80,000 feet. This was uh, the predecessor to the SR-71, Blackbird. Still flying today, the Blackbird pushed the envelope of supersonic aerodynamic technology. Like the U-2, the SR-71 Blackbird 
was used for high-altitude military reconnaissance. But as enemy technology advanced, and even our most sophisticated aircraft became vulnerable, the clandestine projects at Area 51 took on an urgent and surprisingly new direction. According to some experts, a very different kind of aircraft was being tested in the dark skies above Area 51. It turns out that various agents of ours were able to procure Russian military hardware. This means entire MiG fighters, radar, air defense systems, etc. Obviously, certain people in certain governments and militaries behind the Iron Curtain were corruptible, and somehow the stuff ended up at Groom Lake. And there were squadrons of guys called Red Hats, who were American pilots who flew MiGs. Possessing your enemy's weapon and taking it apart is hugely useful to you. This is a great coup. And it turned out that was an important thing going on at Groom Lake. That was really a highly kept secret. But Russian MiGs and the Red Hat Squad weren't the only secrets being kept at Area 51. When you follow Groom Lake into the 70s, then you start getting into the era of stealth. And this is when the half blue planes were developed and tested at Groom Lake. They call them technology demonstrators. And the idea was, hey, we figured out that you can really manipulate radar reflections by having these flat, faceted surfaces so the thing looks like somebody's diamond ring. But what, is it going to fly? Well, okay, you'd better build one and try that out before you order a whole bunch of these. And the half blues were little two-third size kind of hand-built jobs that prove, yes, you can, you can make these things aerodynamic and controllable, and you can make them extremely hard to see on radar. And at the same time, Another really weird program, which was just declassified, called Tacit Blue, which is uh, uh, just an ugly, ugly device. It looked like a cross between a loaf of French bread and a snow shovel. And what these guys were trying to do was figure out uh, compound contours, going beyond the flat, faceted stealth shapes and getting into a smooth, like your car body, has nice rounded curves on it. From the Have Blue and Tacit Blue projects emerged the technology for America's most top secret aircraft to date. For years, there were reports of strange black wedges piercing the skies near Groom Lake. And rumors of a stealth aircraft decades ahead of its time. For once, it seemed the rumors about Area 51 proved to be more fact than fiction, when in 1988 the U.S. military officially unveiled the B-2 stealth bomber and the F-117 stealth fighter. The Air Force uses secrecy to shield advanced technology. The hope is that if we can keep something in the dark as long as possible, a potential enemy will not gain an advantage. Such was true with the stealth program. During the uh, testing of the F-117, everything evolved around working at night. The mechanics, the engineers, the pilots, everybody uh, adapted to living at night. The men who flew uh, the black jets, it's called, they all wear black. In February of 1991, the years of secret flights in the skies of the Nevada desert were put to the test over the desert sands of the Persian Gulf. The F-117, you know, this, this is called the stealth fighter, it's actually a light bomber, uh, turned out to be very useful in the Persian Gulf War, and it works. As the world watched, B-2 stealth bombers and F-117 stealth fighters delivered an unprecedented and devastating rain of firepower on a stunned Iraqi army. Totally unaware that such weapons of mass destruction even existed. And today, the secrets of Area 51 continue. Rumors persist of a highly classified hypersonic aircraft known as the Aurora. 
Aurora is the name that uh, we researchers give to very fast aircraft which have been uh, developed and tested under, under black programs. Although no published photographs of the Aurora exist, there is no shortage of visual interpretations of this alleged high-tech spy plane. Based on revolutionary propulsion technology, this aircraft is said to fly at six times the speed of sound and can attack with pinpoint accuracy. This is a pretty substantial step forward in aviation technology. What it means is you've taken a very big step towards true global war fighting. Um, you have put down the basis for technology which allows you not only to perform reconnaissance missions but to perform uh, precision strike um, anywhere in the globe within a very few hours of the decision to go. Aurora would be a perfect fit with Area 51 because you need a big tract of land and a big base to support this aircraft and hide it. And that's what Area 51 is there for. But to date, our government's position is unwavering. Officials insist that no such aircraft as the Aurora exists. But I can tell you that the committees, the appropriations committees of both houses, the Armed Services Committee, have investigated Aurora till you can be blue in the face. And Aurora does not exist. We wish we had an Aurora, a plane that could travel to Baghdad in three hours. It may be on somebody's drawing boards for such a technology, but right now, that does not exist. This culture of secrecy that surrounds Area 51 has inevitably led to a climate where nothing is too strange to be believed, and true believers have turned the area surrounding the base into a virtual convention center of conspiracy. The one thing I guess that a lot of people should understand that Nevada has the one and the only extraterrestrial highway in the world. In 1996, the state of Nevada officially dubbed Route 375 the extraterrestrial highway due to the countless sightings of UFOs reported by residents and visitors to the area. Look at that, isn't that great? Look at that! Yeah. The whole UFO and alien connection to Area 51 can be traced directly to one man, MIT graduate and physicist Bob Lazar. The Area 51 story at first became public to the public eye in 1988-89 when Bob Lazar came out with his story that he had in fact worked on alien spacecraft at Area 51. When Lazar went public with his claims, the media went wild. It took me seven or eight months to talk him into sitting down for an interview. And when we finally sat down, he told me the most incredible story I've ever heard as a journalist. That uh, he worked at an area called S4, south of Groom Lake. That uh, the facility was built into the side of a, a mountain uh, to make it disguised. The hangars were disguised to look like part of the mountain. That inside this mountain were a series of nine different hangars. And inside each of the hangar was something that looked like a flying saucer. Uh, he saw one of them fly in a test flight. While at the base, he was allowed to read several briefing documents, which indicated that uh, these were of alien origin. So it was a pretty fantastic story. But Bob Lazar's claims did not convince everyone. He may have seen something that he kind of portrayed as being alien, because maybe it didn't fit his normal description of what would be a uh, Department of Defense or Department of Energy uh, I, you know, I've been out there. There is no UFOs, there's no aliens, there's nothing like that there. This is a top secret facility, but not for that type of thing. The Bob Lazar story can leave one very schizophrenic. Uh, there's a lot of good evidence that he's telling the truth, uh, but my sense is that things did not happen, as Lazar says. But whenever you want to make a Bob Lazar, he is the springboard that just launched this spooky base into the public eye. Within months, thousands flocked to the Nevada desert to search for strange objects in the sky. 
The concept of visitations by extraterrestrial beings has become a large part of popular culture. It's drawn hundreds, perhaps thousands of visitors out to an area of the desert that ordinarily would be avoided by most sensible people. That's Bald Mountain. On the other side is Groom Lake. Not surprisingly, reports of UFOs and bizarre creatures from other worlds became almost commonplace. A bright star. Holy sh! Come here, look at this. No, it's not. It's got two lobes on either side. Two very distinctive lobes on either side of it. Come here, look at it through the, through this. Come here. It may be that uh, people want to believe that we're being visited by beings from an advanced civilization. There's supposed to be some nasty ones here now. The reptiles. The rumor is, allegedly, they're coming from 100 million light years out. They're making that time jump. That's what I saw. Yeah. It's cool. That is so cool. The sudden interest and influx of tourists into the area helped transform the nearby town of Rachel, Nevada. Once just a tiny dot on a map, Rachel has become a mecca for believers and non-believers alike. People come out here in a search for the meaning for life. They want answers to things they can't find anywhere else. Many of the curious drop by the little alley inn to escape the desert heat and swap stories of close encounters of every kind. I, I don't think there's a day go by that we don't hear something from somebody. A lot of people have actually worked at Area 51 and they have told me that they worked with beings who were from another planet. And they, they said there's more than one kind. A large and a small nose gray, a reptile, an orange, a blue, and the humanoids. I don't think that there's yet a complete story on what may be over that hill. I, in, in my heart, would like to think that there are aliens in Area 51, but I don't really believe it until I see more. But it's a great subject for motion picture. As executive producer of the blockbuster sci-fi thriller Independence Day, Bill Fay encountered a rather odd official response when he sought the military's technical support in making the film. We had a, a meeting with all the branches of the military and Department of Defense representatives, and they said, um, we really like this script. You know, this is, portrays the military in a very good light. Um, we like pretty much everything about it except for one thing. We want you to take out all the references to Area 51. We were sort of surprised. <laughs> we weren't sure where that uh, um, was coming from. The whole point of the film is playing off on the mythology of Area 51, and, and that really strikes a chord with people, obviously. So it's something that we couldn't possibly change. I mean, it was an integral part of the story, and we sort of told them that, and they said, okay, we can't help you. Why is the military so concerned about aliens and Area 51? Ironically, in August 1997, after decades of denials about everything from the U-2 to the Aurora, the CIA made a shocking admission. There was a CIA report released that admitted that the Air Force has used UFOs starting from the 40s, 50s, 60s on to the present as a cover story for some of their activities. According to the CIA's official statement, thousands of UFOs reported by eyewitnesses were merely covert test and reconnaissance flights. When you compile a log of the flights of the historic U-2, the SR-71 and its predecessor, and tacit blue, which led to the development of the stealth fighter, the hero of the Gulf War, you will have all of the UFO sightings in Area 51 accounted for. But why allow the rumors of UFOs and aliens to run so rampant? The CIA spends over half of its budget in counterintelligence and disinformation activities. The idea being, if we can tie up the enemy and get them to waste their energy and resources chasing down things that don't exist, then that's a way that we can get an advantage over them. So if you dismiss these claims as being claims of UFOs, people will not investigate them further. It was a very clever cover story. Many believe that the recent admission by the CIA 
is nothing more than their latest bit of disinformation intended to cover up the truth about UFOs and Area 51. There could be aliens, there could not be aliens, but the reality is there is a major facility there. There's no doubt about it. You can just look over the mountain and see it. What has happened at Area 51 is that in an attempt to keep the facility as secret as possible, they have actually made it as famous as it could possibly be. It is now practically a household word. And all of that attention has put this once inconspicuous and unassuming installation on the map for just about anyone to find. And this is where the government goes when it wants to be alone, you know, despite our best efforts to peer into it, uh, and despite trying to track down people who have worked there and have seen things, uh, it's still a very black place. Locating the top secret facility is fairly simple, but getting inside is an altogether different matter. There is no fence surrounding the Groom Lake area. There is a border. It's poorly marked, but it is defined by a number of orange posts. It's ringed by mountains. It's very hostile. If, if you're out here during the summer and you don't drink a couple gallons of water a day, two or three days, you're dead. And if Mother Nature isn't enough to deter the persistent trespasser, then the ever-present and far-reaching security system usually does the trick. Behind me right now are two men who are security guards for the secret base, Area 51. They're up there watching us, watching everything we do. They have high-power binoculars. There are several remote TV cameras along this ridge line. The whole area is sewn with magnetic sensors and electro-optical trip sensors. And perhaps they're even listening to us right now. The area around the base, even on public land, is laced with road sensors to detect vehicles traveling on the dirt roads back in the back country outside the base. So the security guards know you're coming. Some claim that the security technology is so advanced that the folks at Area 51 can even smell you coming. It is rumored that the perimeter is laced with sophisticated sensors capable of distinguishing odors emitted by humans from the distinct smells of other desert creatures roaming the area. There'll be signs saying, stop here, you know, unexploded ordnance, contaminated area, radiation, or, you know, a little line that says, use of deadly force authorized. That stops most people. Uh, the foolish uh, are the ones that go on beyond that. People start coming down in jeeps and four-wheelers, and all of a sudden they're presented with uh, a couple of guys with uh, automatic rifles, and they, they get resentful that they're told to go back up the road, and if you turn around, you could be shot. People who have been unfortunate enough to continue to the guardhouse have been arrested. Inevitably, they are uh, tackled, uh, thrown to the ground. Uh, you know, they get their necks stepped on, they get hogtied, and... Uh, hauled off to the Husko. And held for long periods of time and had to pay hefty fines, uh, as well as having to sign away rights to talk about what they'd seen, even though they hadn't seen anything because they never got anywhere near the base. In recent years, the new attention being lavished on Area 51 has resulted in tighter security and an ever-expanding perimeter. There used to be two mountains that you could look down into um, Area 51. One was Freedom Ridge, just right up there where the security patrol is looking down on us. And over that hill right there was Whitesides Mountain, uh, 11 and 12 miles away, respectively. You had a really nice view, but the Air Force um, requested and was granted a 4,000-acre withdrawal that took those two mountains and made them the restricted area. Uh, so now those places are off limits, and we have to go 26 miles away to Tickaboo Peak. While millions of dollars in man hours are spent keeping people out of Area 51, the government also goes to great lengths to get people in. We're at what's known as the Janet Terminal. This is where the vast majority of the workers at the Groom Lake base park their cars and fly in a private fleet of aircraft to Area 51. 
Located on the northwest corner of the main commercial airport in Las Vegas, the Janet Terminal is the employee's gateway to Area 51. There dwells a fleet of Boeing 737s. They're white and they have a red stripe on them. And these planes uh, load people who show up and you park their cars in, in a secured parking lot. And they wait in the little terminal until it's time to go. These aircraft are owned by the Air Force, but when they're referred to on FAA frequencies, they're known as JANET, just like another flight might be known as TWA-123. These are known as JANET-123. Like nearly everything else concerning Area 51, the origins of the name JANET given to these flights and the terminal itself is a mystery. And what on the surface appears to many to be just normal activity can be perceived by trained eyes quite differently. Everyone that you see get on these planes is conspicuously casual. This is a mixture of civilian workers and military workers. You can't tell the difference. You don't see any business suits. You don't see any military uniforms. You just see people in baseball caps carrying uh, duffel bags. The rule at this facility is keep it low key and it's so low key that it draws attention to the place. So these Janet airplanes peel out of Vegas just like any other plane would, except they go north. And in fact, the Janet airplanes are responsible for a lot of heartfelt UFO sightings because uh, uh, some of them fly at night and some of them start coming in around 4.30 in the morning. And if you stand up on some of the hills we used to stand on before the land was grabbed by the military, you could see the landing lights of one of these planes coming in and due to the approach path and the angle that, we're, that you're at, etc., you see an extremely bright light coming at you for maybe five, eight minutes that is almost still, but not quite still. And this is like, that's got to be a mothership from Zeta Reticuli, right? No, it's a 737. And the Area 51 employees who don't like to fly go by bus. In inconspicuous vehicles that travel to the Groom Lake facility on a daily basis. What exactly happens after employees arrive at their destination is, of course, a secret. Protected under strictly enforced national security regulations. All workers who uh, go to Groom Lake are required to sign secrecy oaths, promising that they will never disclose uh, anything that they've seen or heard out there or tell about the work they've done. The problem with a base that doesn't exist is that it doesn't have to obey the public laws. A base that doesn't exist has to, doesn't have to worry about worker rights. It doesn't have to worry about environmental laws. If workers can't even talk about it, and the government won't admit it exists, then who is accountable when something goes terribly wrong? The shroud of secrecy enveloping Area 51 was suddenly threatened when a group of former workers filed a lawsuit in federal court, alleging criminal wrongdoing by the government. The Area 51 litigation is very serious because it involves allegations not just of criminal conduct, but allegations that criminal acts were knowingly committed under the veil of secrecy, and that those criminal acts may have resulted in the deaths of two people and the injuries to a large number of other workers. In their lawsuit, the former workers claim that for more than a decade, the government secretly and knowingly burned highly toxic waste at Area 51. The government had decided that Area 51 did not exist legally or officially. So they didn't want to cart off trash and garbage and hazardous waste from this large air base. Nothing going in really went out. And as they started to do experimental aircraft and started to operate large numbers of planes, they started to produce a lot of hazardous waste. So they started to burn it, which of course is a crime. It was a hazardous waste dump that was being used as an open-air disposal system. In August of 1994, 
Helen Frost filed a lawsuit on behalf of her late husband and six other former employees of Area 51. They, too, had been forced to silently suffer with similar conditions. But right from the start, attorney Jonathan Turley knew he was fighting an uphill battle. Even when we filed this case for the first two hearings, the government refused to admit the existence of Area 51. Now, this is a base that you can see from public lands. This is a base that has pictures taken of it. The Russians, under treaty, are allowed to fly over it. And you've got these Department of Justice lawyers saying, well, we can't admit or deny the existence of this base. And I'm looking at them, and I'm saying, I'll drive you to the damn base, Judge. I can point at it. On September 29th, 1995, after more than four decades of official denials, the U.S. government actually, for the first time, acknowledged the existence of Area 51 within the documents of Presidential Determination Number 9545. However, rather than helping the workers' lawsuit, this official admission served only to increase the secrecy surrounding Area 51. President Clinton signed a deferment for these guys saying, no, you do not have to respond to certain inquiries relating to this lawsuit, and this is under the aegis of national security. That suit, I think, is really running into a roadblock with this presidential order. When you give an agency the prerogative to pursue its agenda, discarding all others, there are going to be abuses, and we're paying for those abuses now. The recent controversy surrounding Area 51 may now be a moot point. An article written by Jim Wilson and published in Popular Mechanics came to a rather surprising conclusion that Area 51 has been moved. The proof for the decision to move Area 51 is absence of activity at the site. The ongoing reports we would receive of strange lights in the sky suddenly began to diminish. The number of sonic booms that were reported began to diminish. What had been happening there had very clearly stopped to happen. Suspicious of the sudden drop off in activity, Wilson decided to investigate firsthand and drove to the Groom Lake facility where he found no one. Complete emptiness. I drove along the road leading to the Groom Dry Lake bed and drove up so far that I actually came to. Uh, a fence delineating the, uh, the bombing range area. Nobody up there. Went to the town of Rachel uh, to check in on some friends who had helped us with previous stories. They weren't there. From this point on, we began to just do some basic detective work. And um, we asked ourselves some questions in terms of, where would you move a base? In his article, Wilson claims that the top secret projects personnel and equipment that were housed at the Groom Lake facility had been transferred to an abandoned missile launch complex in Utah and to other military installations in Colorado. According to Wilson, the move was prompted by two major factors. One of them, radioactive contamination, the result of extensive nuclear tests conducted during the 1940s and 50s. They're now beginning to discover that from the underground test, many materials are actually moving upward through the rock strata, which was something that was never anticipated. There would be times at Area 51 when the facility would have to be evacuated for several days due to radioactive fallout. The site is a very dangerous site, and quite simply, it isn't safe to conduct these operations. The second reason Wilson offers for the abandonment of the Area 51 facility is the changing focus of high-tech military projects. The United States Air Force has subtly changed its mission. It has moved from being an air and space force to being a space and air force. The next generation of secret craft will be ones that are capable of flying in space. In order to do this, you need a different type of launch facility and you also need uh, support facilities that would be very expensive to duplicate. Many of these already exist in the vicinity of Colorado Springs, where you have existing launch facilities, 
and you have a very, very secure landing facility in Michael Air Force Base, which is uh, in the middle of an area that absolutely no one in their right mind wants to get near. This is where they test biological and nerve gas agents. So has this legendary top secret base been shut down for good? And will its secrets die with it? Or is this latest revelation simply just another piece in the disjointed puzzle of the American myth known as Area 51? It's my opinion that we'll never know what has gone on there in the past, let alone what's going on there now. That the government has steadfastly little waverings here and there. Once in a while you'll hear, let's say, yeah, we have an installation out at Bikram Lake. That's about it. I think that a lot of the tension surrounding Area 51 would be reduced if the government simply gave the base a name, said that they were doing secret projects there, and left it at that. It's the idea of a nameless, non-existent base that really grabs the public's attention. People love mysteries. Uh, and as long as we're treated in this, this manner that Groom Lake doesn't really exist, we don't want to talk about it, it just, it just lets the minds run rampant and uh, it's just filled with uh, nice sinister tales of aliens and who knows what else. Since you can't prove what goes on there, you can blame on that place whatever you want. JFK's hooked up with it, you know, Elvis is there, whatever you want. It, it's a perfect blackboard upon which to, to write your dreams and your fears. The government still has uh, projects which are, which are sensitive, and the public's right to know doesn't necessarily include everything. I don't mind them test flying the Aurora or whatever aircraft they are out of Groom Range. It's the other things that have accompanied it hidden behind the veil secrecy that, that bothers me. People want to believe the government is out there doing something uh, and keeping things away from them that they shouldn't know. But there is things that go on out there that need to be done for the national security of this country. It's not because we want to deprive the people of the United States of the information. We want to deprive certain other countries across the ocean of information. What's going on there isn't really a mystery. It is some of the most advanced uh, state-of-the-art work that our government as a nation is doing. And it's one of a handful of facilities in the world that are the state-of-the-art for the whole planet. Hopefully, as more programs are declassified, the true nature of Area 51 will be revealed. Probably a lot of people will be disappointed when they find out how mundane it actually is. But mundane or not, one thing is for certain. The mystique of Area 51 has captured the imagination of a nation. This is a place where some people's dreams do come true. The engineers, the scientists, the men and women who have the vision for these new break-ahead, far-reaching technologies that are developed out here. For people like myself, it's more like a mirage than a dream.